Let's pray. Father, I pray that during the next few minutes you'll speak to us. And I pray we'll value your great salvation. Thank you, Lord, that a great salvation has been delivered to us. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You may be seated. In Acts 16, we have the record of the Apostle Paul and his hair-on-fire approach to winning the world to Jesus. Never have I ever seen anything like the commitment of this man to fulfill the Great Commission. In fact, he was so rabid in his approach that the Lord had to stop him from going two places in Acts 16. And then finally, he gave him permission to go to Macedonia through a dream. And he immediately found a city in Macedonia and began to preach the gospel and signs and wonders followed. And it was amazing how many were giving their lives to God and how many were being healed. And there was a a girl that was used mightily by a couple of entrepreneurs. And she was a soothsayer, the Bible says. That is, she was a clairvoyant, fortune teller. And she began to follow Paul and his group around. And she would just cry out in the streets, these are God's men. These are God's men. Listen to them. These are God's men. And so finally, after a few days, Paul cast the demon out of her that gave her her ability. Now, he didn't do it out of compassion. Finally, she just got on his last nerve. And he just turned around and said, leave. And when that devil left, she no longer could tell fortunes. And of course, it completely destroyed the business model. And when those businessmen heard that, they were so upset. They grabbed uh, Paul and Silas and they took them before the magistrates. And they said, look, we're Romans here and there are rules and laws against what you can do as a Roman. These people are disturbing the peace. They're upsetting the culture of our city. And you're going to have to do something about this. Well, the magistrate wanting to please these men immediately without doing any kind of interview with them, threw them in prison and had them beaten with an inch of their life and put into the inner prison, which I guess was like solitary confinement. Well, for some reason, there was such energy and there was such life in the response of Paul and Silas to all of this conflict that they just felt overwhelmed by praise and worship and they began to worship God. And I mean, they were worshiping loud enough for the whole prison to hear them worshiping God in the midnight hour. And then God got excited. Let me just tell you something. If you want to excite the Lord, you make praise and worship your go-to response for every trial you encounter. And God just shook that prison to the point that the shackles fell off of their arms and their ankles and, and the doors of the prison swung open. Well, the guard heard all of the noise, of course. It was like an earthquake. And he runs down to the place where Paul and Silas were being held. And he saw the door open. It's very dark, so he couldn't see whether the prisoners were gone. But he just assumed anybody in their right mind, any prisoner that has an opportunity to escape is going to escape. And so he knew that that was the death sentence for him to allow anyone to escape from his care. And so he just took his sword and placed it and was about to fall on his sword and commit suicide when all of a sudden Paul and Silas called out to him, hey, 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 don't do that. No, no, we're all here, man. Hey, hey don't be upset. We're, we're still here. And in that moment, after having experienced all that he experienced, he turned to them and his only response was, what 
must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? We are in a year of loving God well. That is our focus. That is our mantra. But more than that, we want this to be a year where we really learn to love God well. And if you're going to love God well, you must know God. And if you know God, you got to be saved. You know, for a long, long time, the church got away from that word, saved. And they said it was ambiguous. They said it wasn't clear. After all, saved from what? I saw a cartoon of a bank that had written on their marquee, Jesus saves. Guess they felt like it was just good promo. But all I can tell you is this word is a Bible word. And it comes from the mouth of a man that was not religious. In fact, it's the word he used as a lost man, as a pagan man, to describe what he needed and what he knew was available because of the two men that were sitting in front of him. He said, what must I do to be saved? And it really is a pretty good word, isn't it? I mean, a very good word. Because when you get saved, you get saved from hell. How many of you understand that is already a great act of salvation? You also get saved from the trouble, the heartache, the squalor of a life that you live out of relationship with the creator of the universe. You get saved the pain of relationships that you should never have in the first place because you have no compass in life. You get saved from disease. So much of the suffering that happens in the world, some of it we go through because we're in the world, but when you really get saved and the presence of God is in you and the angels of the Lord surround you, you can't imagine how many times you are saved from calamity. Oh, nothing like being saved. I began to think about this morning's message. I said, you know, it's been a long time since I've preached about getting saved. I said, I don't even remember the last time that I've just talked about the old, old story. Christ came to save sinners. The more I thought about it, the more excited I got. I began to have that song in my heart. Hallelujah. Saved by his love divine. You know, it's important for every one of us to be excited about our salvation. Got to ask this question this morning, right up front. Anybody here saved? Anybody here excited that Jesus still saves? So this is what I'm going to do during the next few minutes. I'm going to try to answer this question. There are those of you that are sitting in this congregation. They could answer it just like that. I'm going to answer it for you as well. Here's the first thing you must do to be saved. You must recognize your need for the assurance of salvation. You know, when this jailer saw the demonstration of the power of God in breaking shackles and opening prison do doors, I just believe that he immediately somehow knew there was a power at work here that could break the shackles off of his own life and could set him free from his personal prison. When he saw that Paul and Silas were more concerned about his life being spared than escaping that prison, he also knew that he didn't know the God they served. Because there was an inherent confidence 
or an imputed confidence in their lives that he didn't possess. He knew that if those doors had opened, he'd have been out of there. But they sat there confidently because they knew a God that he didn't know. When he firsthand experienced the power of Paul and Silas' praise being lifted in the midnight hour as they sat there with lacerated backs and the discomfort of rough chains on their wrists and ankles, and yet there was this joy emanating and radiating from that prison that caused an earthquake of God's response. He understood there was something out there he didn't have, and he cried out, what? Must I do to be saved? Now, people get saved when they, first of all, get sick and tired of being sick and tired. Write that down. People get saved when they get sick and tired of being sick and tired. When I'm sharing Christ with somebody and they begin to give me all the excuses, all the reasons, and all the rationale, I immediately stop talking to them because I realize they're not sick and tired of being sick and tired yet. You see, when somebody's really ready to give their life to Jesus, they're sick and tired of being sick and tired of waking up with a hangover on Sunday morning and knowing that that still is the only alternative to temporary escape, temporarily escape from their miserable life next weekend. When somebody's sick and tired of being sick and tired, they are ready for an answer and a solution to their miserable marriage. They're ready for an answer and solution to their miserable lifestyle. They're ready for an answer and solution to never be able to put two coins together because it seems that their gambling habit robs them over and over again. When they get sick and tired of being sick and tired, they are tired of the way they are living, and they don't want to continue living like that. People get saved when they see somebody who's saved, and they want what they have. I want to know, how many of you got saved because somebody else in your family got saved first? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you got saved because somebody in your family got saved first. How many of you got saved because you met somebody who was saved and you wanted what they had. Raise your hand. All over this place. Those with family and those you wanted what they had. There's just something that happens in us when we see the glow of God on somebody that that is immensely appealing. Oh man, I want what you have. I, I, I got to have that. I need that. I sat down on a plane by a, a young man. I was coming back from New York City to Springfield, Missouri a lot of years ago. And so I sat in first class because they bumped me up and I thought, thank you, Jesus. Now it'll be easy to sleep. And so I was getting all settled, ready for my long nap from um, New York City, LaGuardia Airport to DFW. And there was a young man who also got bumped up, and he came and sat right by me. And when he sat by me, the Lord spoke to my heart so clearly and said, share the good news with him. Share the gospel with him. And let me just say this to you. I'm not the most spiritual person when I'm tired. <laughs> Let's just get that straight. So at that point, I was rationalizing to say, you know what, that can't be God. God knows how tired I am. I've been preaching all week long. And, I, and again, it was, it was the voice of the Lord. And then, of course, I came to the conclusion, okay, okay. I'm so tired, I certainly wouldn't tell myself to do this, so it has to be God. And so I turned to him, and I just wanted to get it over with, honestly. I just wanted to say it and get it over with. So I turned to him and I just said, uh, hey, man, uh, you ever been born again? So I expected him to say probably no. And I would say, okay. Or he would say, yes. And I would say, good night. He, he said, 
this to me when I ask him that? No. But some of my friends have. And their lives are so changed. I've been looking for somebody to tell me how to be born again. I didn't sleep a wink. I led into the Lord before the plane took off. Didn't even notice that God had, of course, taken care of all the details, placed a Holy Ghost stewardess in the cabin at first class who overheard the conversation and stepped into the galley and began to pray in the Holy Ghost as I shared with him. And after I led him to the Lord, I discipled him for two hours. And then I finally took my Bible, my preaching Bible, and gave it to him and said, you read this every day, you're gonna be fine. You see, the fact is, when somebody sees the glory that's on you, they're gonna want what you have. And people get saved not only because they're tired of their miserable life, but also because they see somebody whose life has been transformed and they want that too. I was in a park in New York City ministering with a group of people. And it was so interesting because these people went to this park on a regular basis. So I was familiar with their ministry. But they also went to prisons. And so I decided that I would tag along to a prison one night with them. And they went into this horrible looking place of incarceration. I mean, I walked in and I, I just feel evil everywhere. And just to see that these men were being confined in quarters that were just not even livable. And I walked into the gymnasium and man, there were just scary people everywhere. And so many guys gathered in this auditorium for this meeting. And I found a great many of them were Christians. But we, this was an evangelistic meeting. And the guy that was preaching just before I was preaching was this tall, lanky, and I'm talking about hard-nosed preacher of the gospel. He got up and he began to preach and he began to tell his story. And this is what he said. He said, for many years, I was a mainline heroin addict. And he said, I hung out in a park. And he said, this same group would come to that park and they would minister. And he said, I played them like I played every Christian group that came to witness in the park. He said, I would pretend to give my life to Jesus to get saved. And he said, then they would give me a few bucks and I'd go get high. He said, that was my routine. He said, until one day, he said, there was a guy that came to pray for me. And he said, may I pray for you? He said, I was going through my routine. I said, absolutely. He said, he put his hand on me and I looked up and I saw that he had track marks. He said, there were track marks in his arm. And it dawned on me for the first time in my life, hey, somebody got out. Hey, somebody got free. And for the first time in my life, I believed I could get free. Because those were track marks, just like the ones I have in my arm. And if that guy got free, then maybe the Jesus that he serves can set me free. And I heard that young man stand there and in such power proclaim the gospel of freedom and salvation to those prisoners saying, let me tell you, he set me free and he can set you free. You see, the fact is we share our testimony because we are made overcomers by the word of our testimony and the blood of the Lamb. And others are called to the blood of the Lamb by the word of our testimony. People get saved when they get sick and tired of being sick and tired. When they don't want to continue living like they're living. When they see someone who is saved. And they want what they have. And people get saved when they are convicted by the Holy Spirit. John 16 and 7. Let me read this to you. I want you to hear it with your heart. 
But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. These are the words of Jesus. Jesus is sitting with his disciples. They're very disturbed that he's leaving. He says, believe me. You got to believe me. I know you can't comprehend this. You can't get your brain around it right now. But it's going to be better for you if I leave. He said, because I am going to send you a comforter, advocate. But if I don't go, he's not going to come. But if I go, he, the Holy Spirit, will come to you. And then he says these powerful words. When he comes, he will prove the word, world to be wrong in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment about sin because people do not believe in me, about righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Now, a lot of us misunderstand what Jesus is saying here. He is using legal terms when he describes the Holy Spirit. He's literally saying, I'm sending you a lawyer. I'm sending you an advocate. And said, there will be no case like the one he's going to present. Because he will present a case against sin that will be irrefutable. And he will present a case for righteousness that will be undeniable. And he will present a case revealing judgment to come that is going to be riveting, convicting, and life transforming. He will be irresistible. He will not be one that will ever lose an argument. When he comes, he's coming as the most dynamic advocate for salvation. And he will do his job. You see, the Word of God says this. No man comes to the Father except the Spirit draws him. Now, here's what we love to say about the Holy Spirit. Well, he's sweet. He's a dove. You can offend him. He'll flutter away. Folks, I'm going to just tell you this. That is the weirdest definition of the Holy Spirit in Scripture I have ever heard of. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit, y'all. I'm talking about the Spirit of God that brooded over the face of the waters in the beginning. And everything that came out of God's mouth, He did. He powerfully scooped out the rivers and built the mountain ranges, spread Miles and continents of green grass and vegetation. Took the very dream in God's heart for every living creature and made it a walking, breathing reality. Oh my goodness. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Mm. It was the Holy Spirit who divided the Red Sea. It was the Holy Spirit who made the sun stand still. It was the Holy Spirit that caused an eight-foot killing machine named Goliath to fall on his face before the supersonic slingshot of an anointed boy. It's the Holy Spirit that called Gideon to stand with 300 and to defeat the mighty war machine of the Midianite army. It was the Holy Spirit, I might add, that got Jesus up out of that tomb on the third day and broke the bonds of death. And it is the Holy Spirit, the scripture says, that dwells in you. And the scripture goes on to say, if that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in your mortal body, it shall quicken you. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit doesn't woo. 
Woo's not in the Bible, by the way. He just woos you. No, 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 no. When the Holy Ghost wants you, he'll come grab you by your lapels and bring you forward. He will shock you with the lens that he provides for you to view life. You will see things like you've never seen them. You will feel things like you've never felt them. You will know things that you never had the capacity to know. He is the supernatural third person of the Godhead. And he will walk right to you face to face and say, you want to go? Because I've never lost one of these. I'm going to show you your sin in a way that will make you nauseous. I am going to show you righteousness in a way that will make you anxious. And I am going to show you judgment to come in a way that will make you incredibly grateful that you don't have to go there. And those of you that are worried about your kids, what I want to tell you today is this. There is the power of the Holy Ghost that is still at large in the world. And all your child needs is one moment in the presence of the Holy Holy Ghost because he who is creator can create the opportunity to bring them to an altar of repentance. He who is comforter can wash the face with their tears and cause them to begin to cry out I want you more than I want my life. He is the one who is able more than able and more than willing to save to the uttermost. Somebody give the Lord praise because he is mm, able. Glory to God. Well, here's the second thing that has to happen. You must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm a believer. I'm a believer. The kind of belief that is spoken of here is covenant belief. You can't believe in Jesus and you must believe in Jesus. He is the way, the truth, the life. You must believe, first of all, he is the only son of God. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no name under heaven, no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Acts 4 and 12. That's what the Bible says. My friend, listen to me. There is no other name that can save you but the name of Jesus. I said there is no other name but the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Whew. I just think you find so much pleasure in this, Father, that I want to say one more time. There is no other name that can save you but the name of Jesus. I remember that song when I was a kid. Well, it won't be old Buddha that's sitting on the throne. Won't be old Muhammad that calls us home. And I don't know the rest of that song, but you get the idea. Everyone in this place needs to get this deep in your spirit. You are right. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the only Savior of the world, you're right. All of these neo-Christian teachers that are trying to make space for some other saviors, all they're doing is insulting the Father. Let me tell you, Jesus is the one who came. Jesus is the one who lived. Jesus is the one who died. Jesus is the one who was resurrected. Jesus is the one who ascended to the right hand of the Father. And Jesus is the one that is coming again. It's Jesus, 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 and nobody but Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here's the second thing. You must believe that he died to give you freedom for your sins, past, present, and future. You say, what can I really do to be saved? And their response was this. Believe on what has already been done. 
You must believe that the only reason you're sitting here is because he died. Now, I know that it's, it's a strange combination of, of belief systems. When you begin to join the Arminian belief system that says you have to maintain a certain clarity in your Christian life all the way to the end to be saved. And then the Calvinist belief system that says, well, no, Jesus did it all. And once you're saved, you know, you're saved forever. But somewhere in the middle is the truth. You cannot after you give your life to Jesus, determine that you're just going to do everything your way. Or you didn't really give him your life. You just gave him a segment. Did you get that? But if you've given him your whole life and you've struggled mightily, he's still with you. He still loves you. He'll get you through the rough patches of ground. You know, when I was a kid, we didn't believe in eternal security. We believed in eternal insecurity. I was at Fairfield Elementary. I was convinced that if I went and watched the Little Red Hen movie with every other kid in the first grade, that Jesus would come while I was in there and leave me because motion pictures were sin and everybody knew that. What I will tell you is that that's not correct. What I'm going to tell you is that the Lord promises to be with you even unto the end of the age, but you've got to make sure you're saved. Because saved people are not trying to find excuses around obedience. Saved people are crushed by their disobedience. Saved people are convicted by their sins. Saved people are horrified that God would ever, ever be dishonored by their behavior. So you see, the fact is, this is where I fall. That if somebody gave their lives to Jesus and they're living like hell all the time, then I don't think they really got saved because saved people think differently. They speak differently. They feel differently. They behave differently. And it's important for everyone in this place to know whether or not you're really saved. Because if your heart isn't changed and your thinking isn't changed, then you have not experienced regeneration. You are not saved. You need to be saved. And this morning, you need to ask the question of the jailer, what must I do to be saved? Now, this is what the word says. It says he rose from the dead to give you freedom from death. And you have to believe that. The Holy Spirit raised him up. The Holy Spirit is regenerating you and strengthening you. The Word of God says in, in John 1 and 12, it says, For as many as received him, to them gave you the power to become the sons of God. You have the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And you, you also have to believe this about Jesus. You have to believe that he is alive today and invites you to an eternal friendship with God. You see, when Jesus died and he was raised from the dead, he went to the right hand of the Father and he sat down, but he didn't sit down because he was never going to do anything again. He is your advocate to this very day. He is your intercessor to this very day. He will answer your prayers to this very day. That's what it means to be saved. Word of God says, therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. And then in Romans 5 and 10, the word of God says, for if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? Hallelujah. Now here's the third thing. You must seal the fact that you believe with a covenant statement or a covenant commitment. People have said, why would I have to confess with my mouth when the Lord already knows my heart? Because salvation is a covenant act. Everybody say covenant act. Abraham, who is the father of faith, 
got so impatient waiting for the word of God to be fulfilled that he one day said to Almighty God, how am I going to know that you're really going to do this? Now, God did not rebuke him because he knew what this ancient man was asking. He was literally asking God about a covenant. Because in ancient times, one man would make a covenant with another by splitting animals in two and putting the pieces on each side and sprinkling the blood in the middle, and then they would walk together back and forth between the covenant pieces, sealing this commitment they were making. What kind of commitment was it? It was the most binding and serious commitment that one individual could make to another individual in that day. They would say things like this, my family belongs to you, your family belongs to me. I will care for them my whole life. You will care for my family, their whole lives. You'll never do without food because if we have it, you have it. You'll never do without employment because if we are able to employ you, we're going to employ you. It was that kind of thing. It was that serious. And they understood when they finished making that commitment, there was no backing out. That was a covenant for life, but it was not complete until they made the promises, until they said with their mouth what the contract would be. Now, let me just give you what happened with Abraham. God said, okay, you want a covenant? I'll give you one. He said, go ahead and prepare the pieces. In fact, God didn't answer Abraham with any kind of disdain or correction when he said, how am I going to know? I mean, he's God. He could have just said, I'm God. Dude, I'm God. Do you know how many people are having a conversation with me today? Nobody on the planet but you. That's got to be enough. He, he didn't. He wanted the covenant. God said, okay, make the pieces. So Abraham, he slaughtered the animals, put the pieces, got the blood ready, and he sat over and he waited. And the Lord put him to sleep. He went sound asleep, and he woke up at night. And when he woke up, he saw the, what, he, what he called a torch that was passing between the pieces, up and down, just like covenant men would. And it dawned on him. God is cutting a covenant with himself. He's doing my part and he's doing his part. And what you have to understand about that story is that's our story. Because when you, with your words, say to God, I accept you as my personal savior, Jesus. I will give my life to you. I turn my back on my sins that is your part because there's no way that you can save yourself and there's no way that you're worthy to enter into a covenant with Almighty God. So just like God did Abraham's part and his part, God does his part and he does your part. You never can become righteous, but he says, I'll make you righteous. You never can become fit and powerful to live and to overcome, but he says, I'll do that too. You could never deserve going to heaven, but he opens wide the gates of heaven and welcomes you in because he says so, you're there. And that's why we have to seal this with Lord Jesus I receive you as my personal Savior and my Lord. And then here's the last thing. You must be baptized on the right side of your repentance. This is what I believe. I believe it with all my heart. Listen to these phrases. Pretend you're hearing them for the first time and they haven't been diluted by the theology of the local pastor or by your denominational group, or what you've heard traditionally from other Christians, or even your parents. Just pretend you're hearing these for the first time and that they mean exactly what they say. You ready? I want you to listen to these passages. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What, what do you think that means? Does that mean repent and be baptized as an outward demonstration of an inner work of the Holy Spirit? Because that's sure not in the Bible. 
Let me read you another one. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. Acts twenty two sixteen. And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Calling on his name. Galatians 3, 27. For as many of you as were baptized unto Christ have put on Christ. John 3 and 5. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. 1 Peter 3, 21. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, this is all over the scripture. There is no principle that is profound, as profound as baptism when it comes to your salvation. And yet, we somehow have had the nerve to dilute this message and to take infant baptism where there's no repentance at all. Or, I just got baptized with my buddies. I wasn't saved, but I hope that does it. It doesn't. You must be baptized on the right side of your repentance. That's the Bible, folks. We have got to get back to believing the Bible. Who do we in America think we are? We're trying to make it so easy for folks. We are trying to soft pedal this message when the message is just fine the way it is. It has worked for 2,000 years, and it will work for us now. Stand with me, please, all over this place. Now I'm going to review. Say, well, Pastor, you know, I knew most all of this. I know. So did I. But all I can tell you is every once in a while, we just need to hear about getting saved again. And so we can ask ourselves, number one, are we saved? We can ask ourselves about our children and our loved ones. Are they really saved? So that we can pray accurately and powerfully for those that we love. Last night, we were all together having a wonderful dinner. And these guys just began to ask me questions about my life. And um, the first question they ask is, how did you get saved, coach? <laughs> and I told them how I got saved. Five years old. I really got saved at five years old. Amazing. My dad baptized me in water. I couldn't even see out the baptistry. But I was saved on the right side of my repentance. So, man, you had a lot to confess, didn't you, at five years old? Yeah, I was all strung out on Milky Ways and popping M&Ms. I was drinking about a fifth of Kool-Aid every day. Jesus saved me. Hallelujah. What I will tell you is I got saved and it stuck and what I want you to understand is that there's not anything in the world as important as knowing that you're saved for some of you the Christian life has made no change at all in you in your thinking and the way you feel about life and others in the bondages of your life and the limitations of your life? Is it possible maybe that you didn't get saved? Is it possible that you just went through the motions and maybe you didn't really sincerely with all of your heart ask Jesus to come into your life? You see, I think that's very possible. I have a friend by the name of James Robinson and he's a legendary preacher and evangelist. He has a TV show 
on several of the networks, Christian networks. And I'll never forget James sharing how that he was a young evangelist traveling, newly married, married a church girl, a girl that was committed to the church, man. And, you know, she was a professing Christian. He said, I remember giving an invitation at our home church one Sunday morning when I was preaching there for the pastor and said, my wife was in the choir. said, and she stepped out in her choir robe and answered the invitation. And I said, Betty, what's wrong? What's, what's happening? And she said, I'm not saved. I came to get saved. And interesting. Kids that have grown up in this church, shielded and comforted by Christian parents in a wonderful, loving environment, can grow up and not really be saved. It's important that we know that we're saved. Right now, we're going to do something powerful. We're going to become the instrument in God's hands to make sure that people are confronted. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you when I give the signal, I'm going to ask you to turn to the person beside you and I want you to ask them this question. Are you absolutely sure your life is right with God? I want you to do that if you're sitting by your husband or your wife or your mom or your dad or the best Christian you know in the world. I want everybody to do it because God releases a special power when we all flow in unity. Are you absolutely sure your life is right with God? And for some of you, this may be the day when you go, man, I feel something's always been missing and I feel that maybe I have not really given my life to Jesus in totality. I really haven't been saved. And you're going to have an opportunity today to know that your name's written in the book of life, to know you're going to heaven, to know you've been saved from all of the mess and confusion and dysfunction of this world and your world. You're going to have a chance to know Jesus. When I give you the signal, turn to the person beside you and just ask this question. Are you absolutely sure your life is right with God? If that person says no, no, I'm not sure, then I want the two of you, the one who asked and the one who answered, I want you to step out of the aisle and I want you to come and stand right here because I'm going to pray for you. Today, we will have names written in the Lord's book, the book of life. Let me pray. Father, Please do this in Jesus' name, we pray. And we give you glory. Amen. I want you quietly and reverently, and no one rejoice or laugh. We'll do that later. But I want you right now, quietly and reverently, turn to the person beside you and ask them, are you absolutely sure your life is right with God? If they say no, I want the two of you to come and stand right here. This is our moment. This is your moment. God is going to do a work in your life. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, just as I am without one plea, but thy, thy love was shed. For me and that's me Praise God. Look at me, listen to me. Half of it's done as far as your job because the Word of God says that we believe in our heart. You wouldn't be here if that weren't happening. And now the only other thing to do is to confess with your mouth in covenant that everything you have is His and therefore everything He has is yours. So I want you right now to pray this prayer with me. Jesus, I am here 
because I am a believer. And I ask you to forgive me for my sins and that this will be a brand new beginning for me. Thank you that you love me. I don't want to just be religious. I want to be saved. And I thank you. And I declare that today I am saved by the blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God.